Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Who is there in here that will dare to proclaim your liberty and your deliverance from whatever you're going through? Who is there? Say, say it out. Name it. Name what God has delivered you from. Name what you've been standing in faith for deliverance. Name it right now out of your mouth. Name it. Declare your victory now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Your victory is in your mouth. But if you don't use it, you got no victory. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Father. Hallelujah. You know, you can possess all the victory Jesus has, but if you don't use your mouth to proclaim it, you'll never walk in everything God has provided for you. That's not comfortable, I understand. <laughs> but you know what? Jesus has put victory in your mouth. Yes. Amen. Yes. He's given you the victory. Amen. Amen. Yes. He's put it on the inside of you. Yes. And how you activate that victory to see it come, come to pass in your life is through your mouth. Yes. Letting the devil know you can't win and you haven't won. Amen. 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 I have defeated you because of who lives in me. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Well, love on one or two people. Welcome to Real Life Church. We're glad that you have chosen to participate in this service today. Amen. I love you. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, mighty God. I love you. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Glory to you, Lord. Glory, glory, glory. You know, the enemy, this world, everything that is against you is trying to shut your mouth. It's trying to, you know, there's an oppression that is just waiting to invade if we allow it. All right? And so it's very, very and vitally important that we actually speak out of our mouth and declare that we have been freed and set free from oppression, from depression, from heaviness. Amen. Because, you know, this life has got a lot to throw at us. But thanks be to God, he's already overcome everything this life has to throw. Has to throw. Amen. Everything. And beyond this life, you know, everything that the devil, you know, there's a lot of things that are bound up in hell right now. Right? Jesus suffered and overcame and conquered everything that is, that is bound up in hell that you and I will never suffer and never, never face. I don't know if you realize this or not, but he went far beyond what was necessary, right, to obtain our victory. And it wasn't just him dying on the cross and raising, raising from the dead. It was him walking through it victoriously him demonstrating that because of who lived in him who he was not his deity right because he walked as a man just like you and I he chose to lay aside his deity and walk as you and I walk so that we couldn't look to him and say well that, that's because you're God <laughs> you know no person could ever look at, look at Jesus and say well of course you overcame because you're God he can say to us, say, no, I laid that part of me aside to demonstrate to you that as a man of God, a woman, just like you can say, I'm not a woman of God, but those of you women, you can say, because I'm a woman of God or a man of God, all right, I can overcome because Jesus demonstrated how I could do it, yeah. right? He just used the word. He opened his mouth and declared his victory. Amen. Well, hallelujah. That has nothing to do with my message. I'm sure the Lord will tie it. The Lord will tie it in somehow. He always does. Amen. You know, I thought that I learned not to say that anymore, but I'm still saying it. <laughs> so look at, um, at Titus, and let's look at what he has to say. You know, Titus um, was not one of the original 12 apostles or disciples. Uh, he came along later. And he was a great companion and help uh, to, to Paul in his ministry. 
And as, uh, as we see that um, Titus was actually sent by Paul to establish, if you look at, at the first chapter, you can see why he was here, uh, why he was sent to Crete. And that was to actually appoint elders and, and bishops and deacons and so forth uh, in the church so that the church would have a structure by which they would maintain and increase in what the Lord had planted there. And it's vitally important that we see that there is uh, an actual organization to the church and that God doesn't just throw it all together and say, well, hopefully it works out. He actually put things in order so that it, he's, he's actually put everything within the church to make sure that it works out, to make sure that it's healthy, all right? Now, we've seen tremendous abuses in this, and thanks be to God, you know, we, we haven't experienced that here. Thank you, Jesus, amen. Um, yet we're still learning, we're still growing. We've, we've got some things wrong, and we've corrected them. And if we're, there's something we're doing wrong now, we don't know it. <laughs> It's not that we're ignoring things, all right, um, but the Lord hadn't revealed it to us. We've, I've been a part of the church, not just this church, but a part of the kingdom of God for a long time now, or I consider it a long time. In Jesus' timeline, it's just a, a, just a blink of the eye, all right? But I've seen a lot of abuses, and I've heard of, of a lot of abuses that have taken place in the body of Christ. And I've mentioned before, and if y'all remember the submission movement, which is just some crazy nonsense. It started off right in recognizing the authority that God has established in the body of Christ, but then it got off way into error uh, so that it was even dic you know, a dictation or a, a dictatorship that you are, you're there for me, okay? And they got it all backwards and wrong because the leader is actually there for the people, right? right? that the people are not there for the leader. Did you hear about that part? <laughs> Amen. And so Titus is sent here by Paul to establish some of this organization. And he gets down to chapter 3, and verse 8 he says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm. Now you have to get the context because we don't have time to go through all that. Um, but he says, And these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Good and profitable to men. You notice it, Paul is talking to uh, Titus here, and he says the things that you do in the kingdom is profitable for men. Right? That you're actually profiting and benefiting men. Well, I thought I was serving God. You, the key is you are. Because you cannot serve God and please God and profit God without profiting men, without ser serving men. This is the way the kingdom is set up. And some have abused this, I understand that, but we don't abuse that here. Amen. Amen. We want this to be a healthy church. We want this to be a strong church. We want this to be a church that people, I've mentioned before, so that, you know, you don't have to, if you issue, you know, come up with an issue with somebody's life outside of these four walls, you don't have to call somebody from the church to come and help you with this. Right? And I'm going to get into that a little bit later. But I, I will touch on it right now. You have been given the same power, the same authority, the same I, I, I hesitate saying this, same anointing. There's an anointing for you to handle the task that is set before you. You know, if there's a demon-possessed person, you don't have to call the pastor and say, I need you to come and cast this demon out. Well, why? Because you have been given authority over every demonic power, right? You have been given, who, who gave you that? Jesus gave you the authority to cast out demons. You know, that frightens some people. Just the thought of they may have to face a demon someday of somebody being oppressed or, de or um, possessed by a devil. That should not strike fear in you because the truth of the matter is those devils have, have already been stricken with fear because you're there. 
And if you ever realize who you really are, they know they cannot withstand that. Not what you're going to receive someday, but who you are right now in Christ. And we all think that this is the greatest thing. You know, we have power over the devil. Jesus made this clear. Don't rejoice in that. He's saying, listen, guys, that's nothing compared to your name being being written in heaven. You know how much it took to write your name in heaven? See, we don't, we don't think about this too much. Well, he just wrote it down. Oh, no. Oh, no. It went way beyond just him grabbing a pen and writing something down. Because you were not qualified to be written in heaven until he died and raised from the dead and secured your salvation for eternity. All right? There's a whole lot that goes into your name being written in heaven. Amen? Not just grabbing a pen and writing, you know, your name down. Oh, no. It's written, you know, symbolically in the very blood of Jesus. Amen? Because of his great love for you. All right? And so him giving you authority over the devil, he's like, that's nothing. That's just me saying, giving you a word. Me just giving you, you know, what I have. Authority. My name is the authority. But you being written in heaven, oh, it goes far beyond me just giving you my name. Amen. So, you know, we need to look at this in the right perspective. Devils are nothing. Man has made have made devils really something. We see whole nations that made the devil really something, and you can see the result of that. But all it takes is one child of God going in to that dark area and saying, that's over with, this is ended, and you're out of here. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Jesus showed up, remember, in the, the uh, Gadarene, right? They knew he was coming before he got there. They knew he was coming. They were prepared for his arrival. And you know what? The, every demon in that man said, what, what have we to do with you? It's not our time yet. What were they saying? We know that our destiny is in hell, but now is not that time. Why are you here? That's what they were asking. Why are you here? I, this is not part of my message either, but you know, we make a big deal out of casting out demons and taking authority over the devil. And listen, there's a whole lot of preachers that want to really magnify this thing. And it's not a magnified ministry. Do you understand? This is, this is what you, the, we train our, our kids to cast out demons when we had a church in Indian Town. We train our kids that devils are nothing compared to the authority that you have in Jesus. Amen. And so we were holding a service. This, this couple wanted us to hold, hold a service. It was a Spanish, you know, uh, majority community. And uh, so they wanted us to hold a service for their family members and friends at their house. And so they set up a tent outside and, you know, we had a meeting. It was a church service outside. And so they brought all their family members to this church service. And I'm preaching the gospel. And all of a sudden, there's some manifestation of a devil back there. And all it was designed to do was to interrupt the message, interrupt the word of God. And so I looked at our kids and I say, go deal with that. Why did I look to the kids? Because that's all it takes. It just takes a child believing who he is. (laughs) That's it. So they took the lady out, you know, a little bit further, you know, off, you know, behind some cars and they cast the devil out of her. (laughs) They... (laughs) Now, the lady, you know, they got her born again. The lady came forward after they dealt with that because, you know, the devil wants recognition. He wants to do all that up here. You know why? Because there's no word going forth as long as there's all this activity going on. There's not the important stuff happening as long as the the display of of flesh is, you know, parading itself and everybody's attention on that. And we made a big deal out of deliverance services and all that, okay? 
And listen, just preach the word. Use the authority Jesus has given you. Amen? The seven sons of Sceva. Pastor Terry wants, likes to talk about them. Okay? The, all they did is they heard how Paul did it, and they tried to do it the same way, except they didn't know Jesus. That's the only difference. And if they got born again and did the same thing, it would have worked. <laughs> but they just tried to do the simple thing that Paul did. I adjure you in Jesus' name. That's it. <laughs> Come out in Jesus' name. That's what they were saying. That's it. And, what, and then the devils realized, Jesus is not in you. I know Paul. I know all these others. But I don't know you because you are not born again. So what was the big deal? What was, what was the, the key to that? Just get born again, and you can deal with this devil. <laughs> but we make a big deal out of the deliverance ministry, okay? And listen, I believe the deliverance ministry should be a part of every ministry, but not the way it's displayed in the world or in the church world, okay? And so we, we need to quit making a magnified ministry out of this and just put it where, in its proper place where it should be, all right? You want to cast out a demon, take them in a back room back there and get rid of it and then bring them back in and let's have service. Let's get them filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we should cast the demon out, get them born again. Sometimes if we just get them born again, the devil leaves. As a matter of fact, if they get born again, the devil has to leave. Let me just tell that. Okay. Because there's no such thing as a demon possessed Christian. You will only be filled with one spirit. Okay, the Holy Spirit or demonic spirit? Let's get it right, okay? Can you be oppressed? Yes. As a Christian, yes. The devil will try to push you down, try to control you, try to restrict you. That's what oppression is. But you can break that stuff off. Amen? And that's what I started saying, okay, is you've got to break it off because it tries to come upon every believer. You know, there's tragedies that take place. There's hurts. There's, there's all this, you know, stuff that happens in everybody's life. Loss. And if we're, not, if we're not watchful, we can let the spirit of grief restrict us and keep us in that same position for the rest of our life, that same condition. My mother was one of those. My mother, I had a, a younger brother. I still have him. He lives in heaven today. A younger brother, he was two and a half years younger than me. And when I was five years old, he got kicked by a horse and, the, and, it, and he died. And my mother grieved for the rest of her life, lived with a spirit of grief because of that for the rest of her life. No one tried, listen, there was no one that actually ministered to her to try to get her out of that. There was no one. Now, I wish that I had known then what I know now because things would have been different, all right? So, you know, somebody can live in that oppression for all their life, but it doesn't matter how long it's been, you can get rid of it. Amen? Amen? You can get rid of it. You can, you can break out of any kind of oppression there may be over somebody's, over your life. Amen. Let's just talk about us, all right? And so just because we experience heartache or pain or whatever, loss, doesn't mean we need to bury ourselves or get buried underneath all that. Come Let's come out of it. Yeah. Amen. God's got a purpose for us, and it's more than just that. Yes. Amen. Amen. And so let's come out of that and let's be used to God. Uh, he goes on and he says, the, uh, this, let me read it again in verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. And so one of the things we've got to continue to do is good works. We don't need to get discouraged because, you know, we're doing our good works and we think nobody sees us or we're not recognized or nobody's paying attention to what we're doing. And I've been doing all this stuff and nobody cares well, who are we doing it for, first of all? All right, are we doing it to be seen by men or are we doing it to be rewarded by our Father? Amen. Because we love our Father, that's the reason we're doing it. Okay? And so we got to make sure 
that we maintain those good works. And so what works are we to maintain? And this is just a small <laughs> list, okay? <clears throat> um, I, I put it under, the first is serving. And underneath serving, I have ushers, greet, and just talking about the church. Ushering, greeting, hospitality, praying for people, working of miracles, supplying the spirit, ministering to others. Okay, those are just, and those are broad, I understand. And the things that Jesus did, the things that Jesus did, working your miracles, that's what I'm supposed to do? Yes. Yes, you are. Amen. Two people, three, okay. <laughs> Let's break out of this. Let's break out of this unbelief, amen, thinking I can't do that, thinking I'm not equipped to do that, all right? Well, I've never done that before. How does that work? That's a different question. That's a different question. Then I can't. I'm not qualified. It's not me. How can I do that? How does that work? Teach me totally different. Amen. Now God is able to show you some things and pour into you and show you exactly how you can be a worker of miracles among the church. Amen. First of all, there's got to be a need, right? You know, you don't just work miracles out in the desert when there's nothing that miracles are used for. Unless you need water. I mean, that's a different story. But, you know, that, I mean, if you're off by yourself and you're, you have everything, then what's the purpose or what's the use of working the miracles? Right? Yet we're not in that position, are we? We're surrounded by needs. We're surrounded by the necessity of miracles. We're surrounded by it. And guess what? God didn't just put one person in this church to make sure there's miracles that take place in the body. Right. Amen. Amen. Amen? That God equipped you, he anointed you, and he qualified you to be a worker of miracles. Amen. Well, how do I do that? Is there somebody that needs a miracle? <laughs> right? That's the first qualification, right? In order for there to be a miracle, there has to be, you know, be the necessary, uh, the, the necessity of a miracle, the need for a miracle, right? I know this is like very elementary. I understand that. But a lot of us miss it. A lot of us think, well, I don't know what, what, what needs to take place for a miracle to happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> a miracle is something that is beyond the ordinary. It is extraordinary, right? It is, it is not just um, what you can do when you're in the natural. It is supernatural, okay? That's who you are on the inside. God has placed his supernatural spirit on the inside of you. That there is no lack. There is no deficit. There is no, nothing in you that says you are not up to, to the task. Nothing. Everything in you says you are well equipped to handle this thing right here, to take care of this. If you look at the deacons, you know what deacons were? They were just the, the servers in the church. Remember the apostles, uh, to cut the story short, at the beginning of the church, there was a, a need for serving tables, to taking care of widows, to taking care of those in need of food and things, and, you know, just necessities, daily necessities. And the apostles said, we're not going to leave the word of God in ministry and prayer to go and serve tables because that would make, that would, I'm putting my words in it, that would mean that we would be out of place. We will be moving from our position that God has ordained us to be in and moving ourselves to a position he has not called us to be in. Okay? And so what did he do? He appointed, he appointed deacons. He appointed those to serve tables. And among those that were serving tables was Stephen. And if you remember Stephen, signs, wonders, and miracles took place 
at the hand of somebody serving a table. Right? right. They didn't say, you are now the Apostle Stephen. Now go serve tables and do miracles. No, never took place. He said, you're anointed to serve tables. That's what they're anointed. That was what the laying on of hands were for. You are now set apart for this ministry. I'm sure in Stephen's mind, he didn't think, well, I'm just here to serve tables. Obviously, that wasn't his thought. His thought was, I'll serve tables, and if there's a need, then I'm here to meet the need. <laughs> right? Now, I don't know about the other ones that were appointed. The other ones that were appointed, you don't hear about all this happening. Philip was one, but he was eventually called Philip the Evangelist. You know, because of Philip the Evangelist, all of Ethiopia, the gospel was preached to all of Ethiopia. Serving tables affected a nation. Let's not miss this, y'all. All right. Realize that God is able to use the smallest thing in our eyes for great purposes. Amen. Amen. All these men, they were just supposed to serve tables. That's all they were supposed to do. That's, let, me, let me say it this way. That was the wrong, wrong thing to say. All they were set aside to do was to take care of this need of serving tables. Right? But evidently something took place on the inside of them and their own thinking that I have been set apart for ministry of serving and I don't see a limit to it. I haven't put boundaries on it. Why? Because God didn't put boundaries on it. You follow me? And so they did miracles, signs, and wonders because I believe it was more than just Stephen. And the reason I say that is because the church grew even after Stephen died. Things happened, healings took place even after Stephen died from that group of people, all right? And so we have to continually serve and maintain the good works that God has assigned us to. But don't limit the good work to just, you know, cutting up, you know, watermelon and serving it to people, (laughs) okay? The reason I say watermelon, we're having a back-to-school bash after the... Uh, next service and we're going to have watermelon we're going to have all kinds of food and, and so you guys hang out and let's 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 partake of that we've got a water slide uh the guys set it up now and so you can go down the water slide just go home and change clothes or bring your clothes back hey man i'm pl- probably going to go down the water slide so just saying it's not just for kids <laughs> well i guess so since i'm a big kid <laughs> Amen. So <clears throat> these are all works of grace. If we look at them as, as real uh, tedious and laborsome works, then we're wearing ourselves out. Without grace, we will run out of us. Grace is what sustains us to do the work time and time and for years and years, and we just keep getting stronger and stronger. We don't get weaker and weaker. We don't get wore out because that's not what grace does. Amen? And so serving is not a laborsome thing. Serving is actually a rejuvenating thing. You want to see the most wore out people in the world? Find the ones that are not doing anything. What are they? They're always tired. They are. They're always tired. They're not doing anything, but they're always tired. I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just saying, you know. It's kind of funny because I've known people in their 90s that they serve and they're just excited about serving. They just keep serving and keep being a blessing and all that. And everybody looks at them, well, how is it that you do that? That person saying that is the one that sits on the sidelines and does nothing and is always tired and they're wondering how that person is doing that. Well, once, that per- once somebody just starts doing it, you'll realize how they do it. When you do it by grace. This is a work of grace. Amen. We're not doing works in our own flesh. Look in Acts chapter 10. verse. Actually, let me go back. I'm sorry. I missed the scripture. Let's look down in verse 14. 
And it says, let our people also learn. I wonder why Paul's gotten to say this again. And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs that they may not be uh, unfruitful that they may not be unfruitful. I, now, I meant to spend more time on this, but I'm running out of time already. Um, but I, I do want to bring this up. He says, let me read it again. And let our people, <coughs> who's our people? The people in our church. Our people, right? Also learn to maintain good works. You notice this is not something that comes... Um, it de- just because we get born again, a lot of times it doesn't just show up. That we've got to learn these things. And what I'm, what this says to me is, we discipline ourselves to do them. That's part of learning, right? Disciplining ourselves, right? And so, a lot of times in learning, we are disciplined or corrected. Because we got to correct some things a lot of times. If I've been lazy all my life and all of a sudden I get born again and now on the inside of me I'm stirred up to actually do something? What? What do you mean do something? Right? I've got to learn those things. All right? Some people that are just, they've, they've worked all their life. They've always stayed busy doing something. It's easy for them, you know, you don't have to really motivate them to do something in the church, right? right? Because they're eager to do something. Because some people, they can't sit down. Now, on that side, sometimes you got to say, you just just sit here and be quiet. Be still. What do you mean be still, right? You ever met people like that? It's like they're sitting there, but they're not still. And even though they might make their body be still for a moment, on the inside, it's like, I gotta move. I gotta do something. Be calm. (laughs) Be still. That starts on the inside of you. And being still and being quiet on the inside should show up on the outside. It should not cause us to be lazy, though, and just sit on the sidelines and say, I'm just being still. I'm just sitting here. I'm being obedient, right? We've got a job to do, guys. We have a calling, amen? We're called to maintain good works and we have to learn those things. And then it goes on to say, and to meet urgent needs. Well, what is that? You know, sometimes somebody will come up to you and say, you know, I got this issue and, and, and I, I just need a little extra help, okay? I, I got a phone bill that showed up and, I'm out of money. I, I don't know how I missed it. And can you, can you help me with this? That's an urgent need, right? Now, I believe that it's the individual body that should be taking care of those things. Amen? I, I truly believe that, if, we're, that if, we, if we endeavor to be led by the Spirit of God, that you won't have to ask for it, if that's you. You won't have to ask for it. There's nothing wrong with asking for it because I miss it. Sometimes I'm, I'm, you know, dull-headed and somebody has to bring something to my attention. Most of the time, if somebody has to bring it to my attention, it's because the Lord's already telling me that this is what I need to do. It's already come up on the inside of me. Hey, I want you to give this person this money. Well, what for? Then we start asking questions. Well, what for? You know, the Lord can just say, it's none of your business. What for? Just give it. Amen. All right. But a lot of times the Lord will stir on the inside of a believer in the church that, hey, I want you to bless this person with this amount of money. And it's when we're not obedient as a body to those things that that person has to come to the the church and ask the church, you know, meaning the pastor or whoever. Okay. Okay. And so that should not be. We should try to eliminate those things, all right? And even if you hear of a need and they had planned on going to the leadership to ask for for this need to be met and you hear of it, well, what's wrong with you just stepping up and say, I want to do that. I want to take care of that. Amen? You know, we're supposed to be sowing seed, right? And if you look at it in the right light, 
yeah, but I need this money. You need seed sown more than you need the money you have. Amen. You need to sow some seed so that you have a harvest coming your way more than you need the current money in your hand. Because if you're not continually sowing, you will, you will end up to, okay, I've sown, now I'm expecting a harvest. Anytime there's a lapse in that and it's not a continual giving and receiving, anytime there's a lapse in that, when you really need it, there'll be a, there'll be a, a lull or a, a delay in the provision coming most of the time. I'm telling you from personal experience. My personal experience is I could see it through my life that I would give and I would give and I would sow into this and I sow into it and I give to this person and all that. And so it just kept coming to me and coming to me and coming to me and I would keep giving. And then it got to the place where like, well, no, I, I'm not doing that. I, I've already sown. So I'm just talking about me. This is what's going on in my own heart and my own mind. No, I've already sown. I'm not, I'm not giving right now. And then sometime in the future, there'll be a lack in supply. Not because of the Lord. The Lord's already established seed time and harvest in the earth. But because of me, I broke the cycle. I broke it. I stopped it. Okay? And so there's been many times when it's like, Lord, I need a harvest. Well, what do you have? He's going to ask you what you have. And then, then he's going to bring, and then you, you, if you're like me, he's going to, well, I don't have anything, Lord. <laughs> well, I don't have, and then he'll remind me, oh, yeah, you got this. Yeah, but touching the holy cow now, okay, the sacred cow, all right? And so there's been things that have been precious to me, but I had no money, no seed to sow in money. And so I've given objects to start the cycle back because I need a harvest. And so some of the things that have been precious to me that the Lord will bring up and say, we've got this. And I'll say, okay, Lord, I've learned. Okay, When he brings something, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to argue with him. I'm just going to give that. Why? Because he has better in mind for me than what I can currently think. He's already thinking of something better for me. And when he's touching on something that's precious to me to give, all he's trying to do is get something better to me, not taking what's precious from me. Amen? And so, you know, to meet urgent needs. Well, what other kind of urgent needs are there? I talked about it already. Miracles. Some people need miracles. You know, Pastor Kirk can only lay hands. We were in Peru, and there were, including the people that were serving, there were probably 230 or 40 people in the building. And, you know, the Lord has been directing him that, you know, he, he releases miracles, and he stands here, and he just prays, and, and the miracle work and power just goes to work, okay? Well, not in Peru this time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not funny, but it kind of is. And so the Lord told him, no, I don't want to do it that way. <laughs> he said, I want you to lay hands on people. <laughs> and so, and we've been here before, in that same location that there'll be 400 people in the building. And, you know, 400 people will line up to have hands laid on them. And many times those 400 people will come to, through two or three times. <laughs> And so he's like, haven't I prayed for 400 people already? Where did all these people come from? <laughs> Same thing happened when we were down there last time. Where did all these people come from? And I said, well, Pastor, you know, I, I believe that everybody emptied out of all the side rooms and everything, and there's probably 240 people in here, and some of them went through the line more than once. <laughs> okay? And so, because I counted, you know, because there were about 20 lined up at a time, and he laid hands on, and then they'd fill it up again, you know. And I counted. I was on the sidelines because sometimes he asked me to help him, you know, lay hands on people. He didn't this time. I'm like, okay. Not that I mind doing it. I'm just, I think it's just funny, okay? And so it, we tease back and forth with weird things, all right? And so those things, you know, he can only lay hands on so many people. You know, Oral Roberts wore his shoulders out 
His rotator cuffs were shot because of the amount of people that he laid hands on. His primary way of ministering to the sick was laying on of hands. He did not get to the place, you know, where he could release the anointing, the miracle working power of God, like we've seen many other ministers do. He, the Lord never directed him to do that. Nor do I know that he actually pursued the Lord about that. So he laid hands on, I don't remember, I, I heard an amount one time, and it was just mind-boggling, the amount of people that he actually laid hands on. Can you imagine laying hand, raising your hands so many times that your shoulders get wore out? That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. And so then after the service is over, he collapses in the back just because of exhaustion. And if you want to test yourself on time, just lift your hands up and see how long you can hold them up. Yeah. You realize like, oh, okay, that's enough. <laughs> Forget about hours. Okay, lifting them up and down, up and down, up and down. And so, you know, he can, Pastor Kirk can only lay hands on a certain amount of people. He can only physically pray for a certain number of people. But you know what the fivefold ministry is to do? Look at, look at Ephesians chapter 4. Start at verse 11. I'm almost out of time. Verse 11 is, says in Ephesians 4, it says, And he himself, I, I like that. I'm trying not to stop there. <laughs> he didn't send an angel to do this. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer, this is why he did all this, to equip the saints, so that we should no longer be children. What does a child do? He's tossed to and fro and carried about by every, with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things in him who is ahead, from whom the whole body joining it together by whatever joint supplies. Everybody look at, look at your neighbor and say, I'm part of the joint that supplies. According to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. How does all that take place? Well, first of all, the fivefold ministry equips and trains up the rest of the body of Christ to do all these works. Amen? And so we've had, uh, anytime we have a, a training, we've had prayer training. Rick and Trina are, are over the prayer training. Because we want you to know how to actually minister in prayer, laying on of hands, praying for somebody. Why is that important? Because you know how many places I've been to and hands have been laid on me and the most ungodly, unscriptural thing has been prayed? Yeah. Well, Lord, I ask that you'd be with them. Unholy, ungodly, and unscriptural. What? That sounds like a good prayer. Terrible prayer. Terrible. Why? He never leaves us nor forsakes us. If you're born again, he lives on the inside of you. Why would you have to ask him to come and be with you? Let's get it scripturally right. Because scripturally wrong does not get answered. Scripturally right gets answered. I'm trying, I know that's hard on somebody, okay? But let's just, let's be corrected by the scripture, amen? Let, let's let the word of God teach us. This, what I'm talking about right here, is equipping you. Whether you realize it or maybe even like it, <laughs> it's equipping you. Because I just, I just gave you some equipment that you've got to pray scripturally, amen? Because if you don't pray scripturally, 
your prayers are not effective. And I know we don't like to hear that. Boy, any prayer is effective. No, it's not. No, it is not. All right? You've got to pray the word. You've got to be accurate in your prayer. That's why we have prayer training. All right? And also, how do you lay hands on somebody? All right? And Pastor Kurt and I have been back and forth on this one. All right? Because, you know, I, I did it one way and he did it another. Both work and both are really the same thing. All right? But... I used to say, in the name of Jesus, okay? And I would, I would emphasize the name, the word name, all right? And he would say, in Jesus' name, <laughs> okay? Because, and this came from Or Roberts and, and uh, Kenneth Hagin and Kenneth Copeland, that when you, when there is a, a certain word or a certain time that you release your faith, from the inside of you into that person and then through your hands into that person. And when you use the name, and I've, I've came over to his side. All right. I'm on the light side now, not the dark side. <laughs> I, know. Right. I, I, I do it his way. I mean, it doesn't really matter to me. It just, that was the way I did it, did it for years. So it, it was just the way I did it. And so, you know, it's the name of Jesus that we've been given as our authority. Amen? It's the name. And so when you speak the name at that point of contact and you speak the name, you're releasing the power of God into their body to affect everything in their body. Who can't do that? All right, good. That's pretty simple, isn't it? He didn't make it difficult, right? Because if he made it difficult, that would have disqualified most people. That's the reason he didn't make it difficult. Because he qualified everyone to be able to do this. You can lay hands on the sick. You can lay hands on what, it, what, what does it say um, in the other one? Urgent needs. Whenever there's an urgent need, right? You can lay hands and see the miracle working power of God go into that urgent need and solve it. Correct it. If it's somebody, you know, there's, there's, several, there's been some major attacks on, in people's lives in our church. And most people don't even know about it. Why? Because we, won't, we don't want to magnify the problem. <laughs> I can tell you this, that the power of God has gone into every one of those situations that is continually working. Yeah. Amen. 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 Now, if you have an urgent need, don't bypass the people in the church. Don't, don't say... Well, I, I don't know if this is important enough. If it's important to you, it's important to the Lord. That's right. If it's affecting you, then we need to know about it so we can help you solve it. Amen. That we can get the power of God on the scene to, to answer that, to, to demolish that thing. Amen. Amen. To crush it, to bring the answer, to bring deliverance and healing and restoration. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Carrie is, is restoring continuously. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Did anybody know anything happened to Carrie? Most people don't know. Well, did anything happen to Carrie? I, you know, there'll be a time it's like, I don't even remember anything happening to me. <laughs> because the restoration has been so effective. Yeah, yeah. Amen. The healing. Yeah. Amen. Has been so effective. It's like, was there anything ever wrong? With me? Amen. That's the way it should be. And so if there's somebody that you know has an urgent need, then don't wait to get somebody else to help. You were there. You were there. Now, we're going to have a, a training to go out and minister uh, salvation to people that don't know the Lord. Some of them will know the Lord, but the people that you meet in Walmart or whatever, uh, that you just ask them, you need prayer or whatever, you know, you're going to get some direction from uh, Minister Rick and Trina and um, Autumn. And so that's coming up the 31st of this month. And so make sure you're here. That's part of equipping. Amen. So that you're bold, so that you don't have to say, hey, I want, will you come to my church? Well, I don't know if I want to come to your church. Is everybody like you? <laughs> Fearful? I'm not sure. But you come and say, and you come up with authority and with boldness and say, God sent me here sent me here to talk to you. 
He's got a message for you. And, and you can say, will you come to my church after you minister to them? All right, that's fine. But don't wait. Minister whatever the Lord's put on your heart to that person. That's who he's called you to be. Amen? <clears throat> In Acts 10, 38, look at that real quick. <clears throat> And this should be a familiar verse, but I like this verse. It's one of my favorite verses, especially in the book of Acts. It says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Now, I want to talk about real quick. He said, God, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Why is it stated that way? Because the writer here, um, Luke, I want you to understand that it wasn't Jesus, God himself. Okay? He's making a distinction here. He said, this is the man Jesus from Nazareth. You can make an earthly connection to him. He was born in Bethlehem. He was raised in Nazareth part of his life. And so not thinking that, well, it was God who God anointed. He's making the distinction. This is a man who laid aside his deity, who God anointed. Why was he making that, that distinction? Making us realize you were one of those men or women that God has anointed. You were just like Jesus and God has anointed you to go about doing good and healing all who are oppressed of the devil. Why? Why? Because God's with you. God's with you. God has filled you up. Wall to wall, Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. So that you can go about doing good. Well, what good? Well, what is there to do good? What is needed? Amen. How can you help? What, what service is, is laid before you? Mow the neighbor's yard. That's good. Okay. Bring your neighbor something to eat. That's good. Introduce yourself to your neighbor. <laughs> well, I don't know my neighbors. Introduce yourself. Amen. Tell them who you are, not what you do. Tell them who you are. I'm a child of the Most High God. Amen. And I live, live in your neighborhood. <laughs> Amen. Child of the Most High God full of the Holy Spirit, power on the scene for anything you have need of, and I live right down the road from you. See, now you're putting an expectation in them. Now you're putting something in them that's like, this is either a crazy person, all right? They may think that way until there's a problem that occurs in their life. I've experienced this, you know, many times, that they thought I was a crazy person and I was rejected by many until they had a problem. <laughs> and it's funny who they run to when there's a problem. When they rejected you before, you know, I, don't have, I don't need none of that stuff. I don't need none of that Jesus stuff. And then there's something that they can't handle. And all of a sudden, they have no answer except maybe that person that has Jesus has an answer for me. And they live right down the road from me. <laughs> Amen. And so... And he says, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. So where does oppression come from? If, first of all, if, if he's healing, then there had to be a sickness. And he's identifying exactly where sickness comes from. Sickness is from the devil, not from God. And so he wouldn't send, you know, God would not send him to go heal those that were sick from God those that were sick because of the oppression of the devil. That's who God sent you to do, what God sent you to do. Amen. He sent you to do the exact same thing. Amen? And he gave you the power to do it. Amen? All right, did you receive anything this morning? Yes. I, I did not go where I was, I had wrote down. Let me just say that. I believe I went where I was supposed to. But Father, we love you and we thank you for your love and your goodness for us. Thank you for your great mercy and your kindness. Lord, we praise you and then we thank you, Father, 
that, Lord, you have blessed us with such a wonderful, loving church. This is the most loving church on the planet. And I thank you that you have filled every one of your believers, every one of your people with your power to do the same works that you did, Jesus, because that's what you anointed them for. And I thank you for teaching them how to operate in that to a, a greater degree every day of their life. And Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Minister Diane, or no, I think, Rick, will you come and close the service, brother? <clears throat> Hallelujah. Minister Curtis said that uh, just stick with the word, right? The word of God will set people free. In Romans chapter 2, it says the goodness of God brings men to repentance. He just taught you about the goodness of God. You have authority. When you become a Christian, you have authority. You don't have to go and ask something. You have the authority inside of you. And we want to give you the opportunity to have that authority, to accept Jesus inside of you. Once that happens, freedom comes. The bondages go away. He shed his blood for your salvation, for your healing, for your prosperity, for complete wholeness. Amen? Amen. That's what it's all about. So bow your head, close your eyes, say this prayer. Uh, for those who are on the internet, you too as well. And just take this time to just make this decision. Amen? Amen. Say this after me. Father, Father thank you, thank you. For, Jesus. for Jesus. I repent, I repent. of my sins, my sins before you. Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. I believe that God raised you from the dead and you are sitting at the right hand of God right now. And I accept that. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, come into me, teach me, and guide me to who you want me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. This is that simple. It's just that simple. It's, there's not a, a three-step process. It's just that, that simple. And if you said that prayer, you're completely free. Amen. But we want to give you the uh, tools to continue your walk with the Lord. So if you made that decision, please give us an email or send us an email at connect at reallifepsl.com and put it in the subject line, I am born again, and we want to give you some materials so you can continue your walk. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the seed that's been planted today. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that we apply it to our lives it continues to grow in our life. We study your word, we work your word out, and then we walk it out, dear Heavenly Father. I thank you, Lord. I call these people blessed, whole, protected, healed, and prosperous. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Oh, heavens. Hallelujah. Oh, you're all doing wonderful this morning. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad to hear that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, um, let me see. We're going to this is going to be a combination of tithes and offerings and building fund, okay? Hallelujah. So the first thing I want to talk about is that it's, it is the Lord's will for us to prosper and be successful. Because it says in, uh, it says in second, second, third John, chapter, uh, not chapter 2, there's no chapter, just one. Verse 2, beloved, I pray that you may prosper and be in health as your soul prospers. So the Lord's plan for us is to prosper, and that's, that, that's what this John is writing. John's writing to the church, and he says that that's, that is his prayer for us because it's the will of God for us to prosper. Okay, so in Psalm 35, 27, it tells us um, um, the Lord takes pleasure in our prosperity, 
Okay, so in order for God to have to have pleasure, that means you have to use your faith. Okay, so it says uh, He takes pleasure in the prosperity of His servants, but His children. We, we are His. Obviously, we serve the Lord, but we are His children. So in, in the New Testament, we are uh, we are His children, and so He has pleasure in our prosperity. Okay, and God's original plan was prosperity, because if you remember in uh, Genesis uh, chapter one, it said, "Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth." Okay, so that was His original. That was the first. That was the the first commandment man ever heard was to be fruitful, multiply, fill. And how do you be fruitful? You have to sow. Okay, so 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 sowing is the way to to receive an, an abundance. Now uh, in Exodus chapter twenty-five, the, this, I just wanted to go over this a little bit. In Exodus twenty-five, the Lord talks to Moses and He tells him to um, to tell the to, to receive an offering. I want to I want to read it for you. Hang on one second. It says, okay. okay, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, tell the sons of Israel to raise a contribution for me from every man whose heart get, who moves him, he, you shall receive you shall raise my contribution. Okay, so here the Lord is going to build, tell going to give Moses um, exact instructions how to build this, this sanctuary. And he tells them, let them construct, in verse 8, let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. So God gives specifics. He, he tells them what to bring, what materials to bring, and then he gives them specifics, what, to, what um, furniture to make, how to build, how to construct this and everything. Okay, so God wants, but he's saying here that so that I could dwell among them. So he wants it to be nice enough so he could dwell among us. Well, obviously, in the New Testament and he's dwelling in us. But still, we have a responsibility. We have to have a, we have a responsibility to God's house to keep it uh, uh, in repair, to uh, if it has uh, a, a mortgage, to pay, help pay off the mortgage. It's, it's our responsibility because, you know, the, the world... The, the world has all kinds of um, fancy things out there, fancy buildings, you know, and... Um, I guess I'll, I'll tell you this. I wasn't going to bring this up, but I'll tell you this. Years ago, um, a congregation that we, when we first came to Florida, there was a congregation that we were attending, and uh, um, they had a real hard time. Uh, they were in a, they were meeting in a church that was and renting space in the church to have their meeting. And then um, in the same area, and it was in a, a, a nice city in, in South Florida, a nice a Kabbalah built a building and it went up like one, two, three. And I was I was so disappointed because I felt like here we were supposed to be people of faith and we were supposed to be building our own building and then we just stayed renting and re renting, you know, every um, every year renewing a, a lease to rent. And these people who were not even worshiping the Lord in truth were, were built this beautiful outlandish building in no time. It was constructed. And I just I just thought that it was it, it, it showed the world. It was not a it was not a testimony to the world. It showed that the, the people of God were like poor and weren't able to do. And here, these people who were not serving the Lord were able to get this building up in no time. So we should not be that. It should be the other way around. So we should we should be a, be a sign to the world that see the children of God, the people of God, we have a, a place to meet to worship the Lord and praise the Lord, and that it should be a, a beautiful. It should be beautiful. It should be. Um, it really should be outlandish, but just yeah. The, just the point is that some a place that's attractive, that where you would want to go to worship the Lord, and not just and not just be like, you know, an eight, eight, eight by ten, you know, on a on a on a, a day to worship the Lord. So anyway. So I, just, so I just wanted to bring that out, that we should have, a, so we should, it's our responsibility to make sure that the house of the Lord is presentable, okay? Okay, so um, we're going to uh, say the uh, declaration of, over your uh, um, tithes and offerings. Yeah. But before we do that, if, I, if you need an envelope, John or um, Jason will give you an envelope. If you're going to text to give, give to um, text code RLCPSL to 44321. And if you're writing out a check, write it out to RLC. And if you're writing out a check, uh, do not uh, take an envelope. Um, and also dis uh, designate if uh, what's tithe and offering and what is uh, building fund. Okay, we're just going to take that one offering this morning. Okay, and this service. Okay. 
All right, count on if we could please have the declaration. Okay, we're going to say this over our, over our finances because we're going to speak life into our finances and growth into our finances. Father, thank you for wisdom and knowledge, spirit-led giving, jobs and better jobs, ideas and inventions, raises and bonuses, benefit sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, discounts and dividends, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, cars and better cars, houses and better houses, houses paid off, debts paid off, debt-free church building and land for real life church, Port St. Lucie and Clewiston. Expenses decreased, blessings increased. Thank you, Lord, for expanding all my financial needs, that I have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, ushers, you may receive the tithes and offerings and building fund. <laughs> 